Is there a limit to how big a star can be? Well, we still don't really know for sure. We know how big the most massive star we've ever found is. It's a star called R136A1 in a big star cluster in the Large Magellanic Cloud, a small satellite galaxy of our galaxy, the Milky Way. And that star is estimated to be 200 times heavier than the sun. So is that a true upper limit to how heavy stars can get set by physics? Or is it just that, you know, more massive stars are rarer and they're less likely to form and so we're less likely to spot them in the universe? So in this video, we're going to dive into the history of the research that's been done on this problem and we're going to chat about how the James Webb Space Telescope can hopefully help us solve it. So let's start way back in 1955 with Edwin Salpeter, who was the first to look at the distribution of stars at different brightnesses. And the brighter the star is, the heavier the star is. And because astronomy is very confusing, what's plotted here on the x-axis is magnitude, a measure of how bright a star is, but the bigger the number, the fainter the star and the less massive it is, and the smaller the number, the brighter the star and the more massive it is. But what you can see is that this function drops off. There's a lot less stars that are brighter. Today, this is called the stellar initial mass function, or IMF. And now we can survey more stars at fainter brightnesses and see at greater distances. So now we know that the IMF looks a little bit more like this with a peak around about half the mass of the sun before it drops off on either side, with less low mass stars and less high mass stars. Now we know that this limit at the lower mass end is actually set by physics. You need enough mass there so it becomes dense enough and hot enough to actually kickstart nuclear fusion from hydrogen into helium, which is what powers stars. Below that, you're in sort of this gray region between sort of things that are planet mass and things that are star mass. And that lower limit is at about 8% of the mass of the sun or 80 times the mass of Jupiter. I've actually made a video about that lower edge before of the mass of stars if you want to check that out. But the big question in this field ever since Salpeter in 1955 has always been, is that also true for the high mass end? Is there some physics here which cuts off the maximum mass of a star? Or or does this distribution just get closer and closer to zero because of pure probabilities? Just because it gets less and less likely that you have enough material there to make a star that massive, and also because massive stars are really short-lived. They only live for a couple of million years or so, so the chance of us actually spotting one in the universe are also pretty low. So there's two different ways that people have tackled this in the past. First, by simulating how stars form to get at the physics of what's going on. And two, searching for the most massive stars in the universe to see if you can find rare over massive ones and see what the limit actually is. So let's just start with option one here. As people started to run the maths and the models for star formation, they thought that they'd very quickly solved this problem. For example, this paper by Larson and Starfield from 1971, which I feel like we just have to take a minute to appreciate Sumner Star field's name, like with a name like that, you can't not become an astronomer, can you? Anywho, uh, Larson and Starfield found there seemed to be a physical limit on how big a star could become because of something known as radiation pressure. For that to happen, the gas needs to be cold. Otherwise, the molecules in the gas have too much energy, they bounce around too much, and they resist that slow collapse down. So you need a cold cloud of gas that slowly contracts to get dense enough and hot enough to eventually kickstart fusion and form a protostar. The problem comes when that gas cloud is very large because the center of it does get dense enough and hot enough to kickstart fusion. But then you start giving out light and heat in that process which then transfers energy to the gas surrounding it. And the gas on the outskirts isn't very tightly held by gravity yet because the whole thing isn't very dense. And so you transfer that energy to the gas on the outskirts and you stop it collapsing down into the star and you stop the star from getting any bigger. Now, Larson and Starfield pointed out this effect becomes more important with increasing mass, especially around about 60 times the mass of the sun. However, fast forward a bit now to the late 80s and 90s. With studies like this one from Nicaro in 1989 and this one from Jujina and Adams in 1996, that point out that you can get more massive stars than this through accretion. So once a protostar has fully formed and it started to spin, it can then start to bring that gas in again under gravity through a process known as accretion. 
essentially, instead of the gas being a cloud anymore, it now gets brought in in a flat disc because the star is spinning. Just like when you take a bowl of pizza dough and you set it spinning above your head and it flattens out into a disc, which means that the gas can be accreted along the equator of the star while the radiation escapes from the poles. And if you run the mass, that means that stars can grow to around about 100 times the mass of the sun before any physical limit kicks in. The problem is the estimates from all of these simulations in theory didn't match with what people were finding in the universe with option two in the search for the most massive stars. So in 1960, Feast, Thackeray and Wesselink were cataloging the brightest stars in the Magellanic Cloud dwarf galaxies. And among those was R136, the central object of the Tarantula Nebula. Following that finding, there were then many studies published resolving R136 into three separate objects. Again, one of which R136A was thought to either be a cluster of stars or a single massive star 2000 times the mass of the sun. The Hubble Space Telescope eventually managed to resolve R136A into a cluster of stars, but one containing the brightest and most massive stars, all of which appeared to be over a hundred times the mass of the sun. In particular, the three brightest stars of R136A, so R136A, one, two, and three, were massively controversial because as people were trying to estimate their masses based on how bright they were, they were getting answers that were way above that upper mass limit that theory and simulations were suggesting. The most massive of them, R136A1, had its mass estimated as recently as 2020 by Bestelener and collaborators as 250 times the mass of the sun, which to get around this issue of it being larger than the upper mass limit suggested by theory, they said it could have been formed if two stars have merged, which sounds crazy, but at the same time, this star cluster contains 25 of the most massive type of stars that we know of in a space that is just 0.2 parsecs. That's only around about 0.6 light years, which if you compare that to the nearest star to the sun being four light years away, you'll realize how dense that actually is to have 25 stars that big in a space that small. However, more recent measurements of the mass of R136A1 by Kalarian collaborators in 2022 with much higher resolution images only estimated it to be between 150 to 200 times the mass of the sun, which puts a lot less pressure on those upper mass limits that we get from theory and simulations, which modern estimates put at around about 150 times the mass of the sun. So maybe we're starting to see some agreement there. And then there are some papers that have argued that we should expect at least one high mass star in the tail end of the distribution, up to around about 500 times the mass of the sun, if there is no true upper mass limit. The fact that we don't see these in these massive star clusters suggests that there is truly a physical upper limit to how big stars can grow. So it feels like we might be getting to some sort of agreement but the problem is that we still don't really understand star formation very well, especially that proto-star formation phase that all of the models and theory rely on. And there, there could just be something that we're missing in those models, especially because star formation occurs in very dusty clouds of gas and that dust blocks out a lot of the visible light that you get from those protostars. So you can't actually observe what's going on. But JWST observes in infrared light at longer wavelengths that are not blocked by smaller dust grains. So you can actually peer into these dusty clouds to see what's going on. For example, this project from McGeeth and collaborators is studying protostars being born with JWST, especially the ones that are accreting material just to study the rates that they can actually grow at. Now that was just one example, but there are so many JWST projects that are devoted to studying star formation in much greater detail, which will help solve a plethora of unsolved problems in astrophysics, but should also help us understand if there truly is a physical limit to how massive a star can be. Before we get to the bloopers, a big thank you to Brilliant for sponsoring this video. Now, there was a lot of fundamental physics about stars and their types and their evolution that I just didn't have time to cover in this video. But would you like a free and easy way to learn more? Well, Brilliant is a website and an app that helps you to learn new concepts in science, maths, and computer science interactively. They have a whole astrophysics course, which I think is amazing with lessons on star formation, energy production in stars, and their evolution as well when they run out of fuel. It's the interactivity of the lessons that make Brilliant so 
good. You know, interactive learning has been shown to be six times more effective than passive learning, like listening to lectures. Plus, you can work at your own pace and there's more detailed explanations if you need them because you get stuck. So to try everything that Brilliant has to offer for free for 30 days, head to brilliant.org forward slash Dr. Becky, or you can click on that link in the video description below. And the first 200 of you that do are going to get 20% off Brilliant's annual premium subscription. So thank you so much to Brilliant for sponsoring this video and for continuing to support this channel. And now, roll those bloopers. Who is the first to look at the distribution of stars at different brightnesses? 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 Brightness, different brightnesses? Different... Oh, everyone sounds wrong. <laughs> different brightness. One. Brightnesses. <laughs> Why is this so hard? Space is hard, words are harder. So stars that you find at different brightnesses. Is. Did it again. Brightnesses. Is. Brightnesses. Is. Different brightnesses. Different brightnesses. Is. Different brightnesses. Is. Who was the first to look at the distribution of stars at different brightnesses? Is. <laughs> Under pressure. Raising pressure, pushing down on me, so I can form a star.